So, hello everyone. Welcome to the challenges of machine learning at scale. My name is Graham Poulter. I'm an SOE at Google Ireland, just up the road. I happen to work on uh, similar systems that uh, I'm going to explain in this, this talk. Uh, yeah, because I'm an SOE on Google's ad click prediction machine learning pipelines. Uh, we're going to go through a more generalized example here. Now, there's, there's only 12 slides, so please feel free to ask questions as we go. I'll repeat them back and then, then answer them, especially if anything is unclear or you'd like me to dive deeper in something or maybe you'd like me to talk more about the failure modes or more about the scaling issues, and I'll be happy to oblige. Uh, yeah, so mostly we're going to focus here on the large system design aspect of it. You know, as an SOE, you, you will often engage in the design discussions for systems, and I think that the, these large machine learning pipelines provide a great example <laughs> for, for many design, design patterns in large systems. And it's rather different from the serving systems you might be used to. Now, I'll also talk about a bit about the failure modes of these pipelines, which are also rather different from serving systems. It's not all about availability or latency. And, and about the, the monitoring and the, the ways that you can make them more robust yeah, as your SOE perspective. Um, <clears throat> yep. Uh, also, if you'd like to get even more insights into the design of large systems, uh, some of my colleagues tomorrow morning will be doing a workshop on large-scale system design. And you can there go through an exercise yourself, uh, given a problem, think about how to, how to design it to scale and reduce failure modes. Now, a bit of an overview for the talk. Because it's ad click prediction, and I figure most of you might not, or not, some of you might not be familiar with the problem, I'm going to briefly introduce the problem and how you can use machine learning to help solve it, maybe better than heuristics. And then I'll show you sort of the basic overview of a, of a training pipeline that will close the, close the loop um, to, yeah, to making these predictions. And I'll dive a bit deeper into the feature extraction aspect, which is interesting in its own right. And, <laughs> and then more about how to scale up the, the training of this. Yes, you can do machine learning on your laptop. That's great. But when you're trying to train on gigabytes of data every second, uh, this, you're going to need a few more tricks up your sleeve. And then, of course, uh, maybe a, a slightly easier problem is serving lots of predictions of those models after you've trained them. Okay, add click prediction. So the example here uh, is just, you imagine you're running an ad network of any sort. You have lots of pages with ad slots. You have lots of ads that you'd like to show. And you have lots of people visiting these pages at various times for various purposes. And the question, when some user with some characteristics visits some particular page, is what is the best ad to show? Uh, now, there's lots of, lots of ways that you can define that. But for simplicity here, we're going to say that the best ad is the one that they're most likely to find engaging and thus click on and maybe stay there for a while and so forth. Um, if, if you don't want to click on it, it is at best a distraction, at worst an annoyance. So showing, showing the ad the user wants to click on is basically the ideal for the, the, the user experience. Uh, now, in this instance, if you consider showing a particular ad, such as this is some old website and it's talking about giving flowers for Valentine's Day, and you have an ad about fantastic bouquet delivery service, um, these are some of the features that you might see, that you might extract from this impression. So maybe the browser is in Ireland, and their browser language is in English, 
Also, they're visiting this page and you've determined that the subjects of the page are flowers and Valentine's Day. And it's a .co.uk page. But then, with the ad that you're considering showing, and you might be considering many, but this particular ad is on a... <coughs> um, just one sec. Uh, is on a dot, dot .ie domain. Hmm. One second here, I've lost my laser pointer. Ah, there we go. Okay, it's back. Um, and the ad is, you know, it's, it contains words about fantastic bouquets, not directly flowers, and it's also in English. And if you're trying to figure out what's the most likely to be clicked on, basically the click-through rate of the ad in this specific circumstance. Uh, you know, there's, there's some things you can do to try and figure out what makes it more likely. So, you know, if, if the ad, if you look down here at the, the country, right, if the, the user's country and the ad's country and the page's country all line up, that's maybe a bit of a positive signal. Similarly, if the ad is using the same subjects and the same words as the page, that's also a positive signal. And you can string together as many heuristics uh, as you like to try and figure, like, okay, what, what are the, the signals that would maybe increase the likelihood of a click here? Um, and, however, you're always going to end up like, looking at only a few of the possibilities. Because while you might look for a keyword match, or oh, ad is flowers and the page uses flowers, what if the ad uses bouquets, right? And yet uh, flowers and bouquets are related, so if they're both present as a word in the page and a word in the ad, that is uh, a positive signal. And machine learning can, can go much further than the heuristics to, to look at all of these possible signals. Um, and of course, it's not just you know, the page being about flowers on its own. It's the fact that, it's, that the page is about flowers and the ad is about flowers. So it's really the combination of features that matters the most. And as soon as you have loads of words in English, loads of words that can be used in ads, you're looking at potentially billions of possible features, each of which may be present or absent, although typically only a few dozen or a few hundred features would be present in any particular case. Now, okay, so let's, let's see what machine learning does with this. Uh, still by way of introducing the problem, we'll see the pipeline shortly. Uh, any questions about the features uh, and the, the problem of showing a, a relevant ad? Okay. <clears throat> the, so th these feature spaces can be billion dimensional, literally. But imagine you can project them down into two dimensions. And maybe the, the situations of you know, page and user and ad where a click happens would tend to be the ones inside that, this circle over here. Um, now, suppose you have a pretty rubbish heuristic or machine learning algorithm. As soon as you make a decision to show or not show based on maybe some threshold of probability, you're drawing an imaginary line through this feature space where anything uh, inside that boundary or that side of the line, you're going to predict that the, you're going to show the ad, which is predicting that you're expecting it to be a click. And on the other side of the line, you're not going to show the ad, which means you predicted there won't be a click. But whatever rule you do, you're going to get some true positives. You show the ad and the user clicks and true negatives, things you didn't show just as well because they never would have been clicked. But where there's always room for improvement is the false positives. This is the, the, the ads that you show and nobody clicked on it, maybe they were even annoyed by it. Uh, you often don't see the false negatives. This is missed revenue where you didn't show the ad but it was actually something that the person would have liked to click on. Right. Um, and the idea is that you know, heuristics and simple models draw simple lines through the space, but with a, with a good model, and if you show it lots of examples of cases where a click happened and cases where no click happened, it can sort of learn the shape of the area where clicks tend to happen in feature space. 
and use that to generalize to new cases. <clears throat> so, uh, before we, now, now you've seen like how machine learning can help with this. Uh, the, let's, let's go into a bit of the requirements for the examples to come because, like I said, you, at a small enough scale, you could do all of this on your laptop. So, uh, you know, if you're handling 10 queries a second and you have a few, a few gigabytes of data, yeah, why not just train a model on your laptop and use it to make predictions? But, uh, so we're going to look at a slightly bigger example. Let's suppose you have at least, say, 100,000 queries a second. And, you know, whichever way you dice it, if you're going to be logging details about those impressions, you're going to, that's going to give you gigabytes a second of data, not just to log, but to process in the machine learning. Um, and of course, if, you're, if you have enough examples and your universe of features are, and is the entire reality of English, and you have lots of pairs and triples of features, you're looking at billions of combinations. In fact, in some cases, your model might be, have too many features to fit in one machine. Then what do you do? Uh, uh, and of course, it's never just one model. So you're, you're an SRE, you'd be happy just to run one model and keep it running reliably, maybe replicate it for, for redundancy. But you, you'll be dealing not just with the people serving predictions from the model, but also with the machine learning experts who are tweaking and making different versions of the model, trying out new ideas, and they're going to want to run lots of experiments and it will go on forever. So you're actually going to train over that day so hundreds, thousands, uh, endless number of times. Uh, and as an SRE, you, you're going to be asking first, well, Okay, all very well. Machine learning, great. Like, exactly what level of service am I defending here? And, well, the answer is going to be an ad kick prediction. It's going to be freshness. Uh, in that, if you train a model and leave it, eventually it's going to make worse and worse predictions because the world moves on. New ads come up, users change what they're looking for, the World Cup happens. Um, and unless your model can adapt to that quickly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to become irrelevant, out of date, and maybe over or under predict. Uh, in serving especially, you're still going to care about latency. So, so the serving side where you're making, making predictions in response to user requests, like user comes, visits a page, you want to predict for a bunch of ads the probability, that's, that's going to be classic uh, serving system stuff. You care about the availability and the latency of those predictions. But I'm going to focus more on the training side, which is a bit different. We all know, we all know all about serving. Right. <clears throat> ah, and lastly, which is really hard for SREs, is the consistent quality of the model. Like, if some weird data comes in, maybe a whole lot of your clicks are marked spam, uh, what, like, it wouldn't do for your model to suddenly predict that every ad is awesome or that every ad is terrible and we stop showing them. You know, in the first case, you annoy users and show too many ads. In the second case, you, you stop making money, basically. Right? Um, and, yeah. Uh, and of course, if you, uh, I guess in serving you always care, but uh, if on the training side, training the models, if you don't care about freshness, you actually don't need SREs at all, because the model, if something goes wrong, the model just gets stale, and if you don't care, you can fix it at your leisure, or the, whoever's running the model can fix it at their leisure. So only really when you want this thing to be, you know, hours fresh, do, do you really care about having someone on call for it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, now, any, any questions about the uh, requirements or the service levels for training a model? Anything? Okay, we're going to move on to the, the general pipeline structure. Now we get into the meat of the, the large system design and the failure modes. Right. So, but let's first take a look at what, what the system looks like without any machine learning. Right? 
basically, you have a front end. It's got some heuristics baked into it about when to show an ad. And uh, it will log the impressions over here, the event logs, and, maybe, and whether the ad was clicked or not. And yeah, probably unhappy users, because your heuristics are not going to be very good for the world of ads. Um, and you notice that the big problem is that you are getting all of these events. You know how you're doing, whether there was a click or not, but you're not learning from it. Your system is basically, has all this experience, but hasn't learned a thing. It keeps making the predictions it always made. Add in machine learning, and you can extract those features from the, the events that we talked about, and then train a model which has basically associates a weight with each feature, in the simplest case. So, uh, you know, a feature has a, a high weight. If this, this feature or combination of features being present indicates likelihood of a click, and a negative or low weight if it indicates actually that nobody's going to click. Right? And you load up those models in a prediction system, so requests come in and say, hey, there's this user from Ireland speaking English, and they're going to this page about Valentine's, and what about this ad about flower delivery? What's the probability for that one? And the prediction will make a bunch of predictions for a bunch of different ads, and then the front end will use that info to figure out, okay, which is the best ad to show, and show it. And hopefully happier users, and happier everyone, really. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the perhaps the simplest way of looking at the big picture. But the devil is in the details, of course. The <clears throat> uh, because you, like, again, all of these phases could fit in one machine at small enough scale. But uh, you're going to, if you've got hundreds of thousands of requests a second, and you're going to have to shard out this learning work somehow, distribute it. Uh, and for one, if you're training lots of models, like you're not just training once, you're going to have version two, version three of the model, and many alternative experiments, then you want to act, this feature extraction work is actually a lot of work. So maybe do that once and save the results, and then you can reuse them many times over. That, that one, one way of helping it. The next thing you do is figure out some way to distribute this learning work. So you look at the, the events for an hour, and you've got so many gigabytes or, or terabytes to train over, and figure out a way to split it up a thousand different ways and update the model. Easier said than done, though, because there's only one model. So you can imagine if you had a giant lock for making an update to the parameters of the model, you basically end up serializing the processing of each event. So you're going to have to figure out a way to make that a bit more parallel, a bit more fine-grained, perhaps. Then, with the prediction serving, that's, in a way, the easy part. Right? If your model fits in one machine, you, uh, then you have one replica. Just load up as many replicas as you need to serve your traffic. Yeah. Now, we're going to dive... A, uh, we're going to dive a bit here into the how do you get those event logs? Because uh, initially, when the front end serves an ad, it shows it's going to show just it's just going to log the fact that hey, I showed an ad, great. But the fact about whether the user clicked only comes later. So long, so you get this impression log, like, hey, for this page, I showed this ad in step two there. But maybe a few seconds or a few minutes later, you get some information like, oh, wait, the user clicked on that, or the user bought this thing, or, or whatever. And that comes in as a separate log referring back to the, the impression. <clears throat> and yeah, it's an inherent property of, of this type of system. And so you're going to need some method of joining those clicks back to the impressions. There are, there are some papers out about this, like the photon paper, about how to do that. Um, <clears throat> and yes, you might keep some recent impressions in memory and match up clicks to them as they come in and do some, 
and, and find a way to make sure each one is processed only once. And then write out the, the event logs. Now, the, this would be the impression together with the label, which is whether or not it was clicked. And that's vital because you, this is what we call supervised learning, where you look at the example of the impression and use the fact of whether it was clicked or not to adjust your weights. And then that goes back and the machine learning magic happens and the front end makes more requests, serves more ads using the model. Okay. Now, um, once you have those events, you're still not ready to train a model because you still need to extract those features. What you have is logs, right? Maybe some structured data with text fields and integer fields. But what you want in the end is basically a whole lot of features that are either present or absent. And so that's where extraction comes in. But again, gigabytes a second, you're going to need to distribute that. And actually, it fits kind of closely to a MapReduce model because you can imagine taking the events, splitting them up a thousand ways, and processing them. But now you get a thousand output files. Imagine like one output file per worker, per block of time, per feature. Yeah. Um, it's, you're looking at tens of thousands of output files. So, uh, so after that, you of course you need a great big reduce phase to combine these so that maybe you have like at preferably one file per feature type per per time period. Um, of course, that's not the whole story, because you could imagine that logging the entire text of the page or everything about the ad with the impression would take up a lot of space. So you don't do that. You, you, you log references to these. But that means if you're going to extract features from the, the page or the ad, you're going to have to look them up somewhere, uh, look up those, those texts. And so when you're extracting, you're going to be doing lookups, joins essentially, to some kind of database to get those, to get those features out. Um, so, now with this part of it, from an SV perspective, you might be like, well, what kind of service level can you guarantee for this? There's, there's data in, data out. Right? There's no, uh, like, you're not looking at the availability or the latency of individual requests. But what you can look at in fact, you can't even look at the freshness of the, the output events because the input events might be stale already. Maybe upstream collection of logs is delayed and then your, your output events are going to be stale too. But what you can do is measure effectively the latency added by the pipeline over here and put some guarantees on that. Um, and yeah, all sorts of things can go wrong, right? The, the lookups could fail, perhaps uh, because some data is missing in the database, or, or perhaps um, there's like a, a spike in traffic and now you don't have enough resources to, uh, to process the data quickly enough. <clears throat> and, and all of that would end up adding latency to the processing. Yep. Um, now, now, finally, uh, having the event features, uh, you see the dotted line from the previous slide, you can come back, you can finally try learning on them. Right. <clears throat> okay. Now, scaling up the, the machine learning is actually really mathematically hairy, so I'm not going to go into those details here, but the large system design of it in one sense, can look a lot like MapReduce, uh, in that, well, same problem as before. You have terabytes of data to train on, or more, in, in some batch. And you want to split it up somehow. So you shard the work just amongst the, the map workers, essentially. And imagine you have, uh, like, yesterday's version of the model, right? The, made, made at the beginning of today. The, the, the trick then is to take these incoming events and work out from them how you would update the weights in the model based on these events. 
So you see lots of cases where the ad was about flowers and the, the page was about Valentine's and people clicked. And you want to increase those, the weights for those features. So you write out a file of stats from each worker about how to do the update. And then a reduce phase would take the, the same model of yesterday, take all those statistics, which are much smaller, update the model, and produce a new version of the model. In reality, it's a little more complicated because you're actually going to do this in a, in a loop a few times because that, that initial version over there isn't going to be maybe the most accurate way to update the weights. But if you then feed it back in and do this again, you can eventually reach a, like a convergence of, on the feature weights. Um, and, and this, of course, is online learning in the sense that you are updating your existing model as new data arrives. Because uh, with enough data, you can, uh, you can imagine that if it takes weeks and weeks or days to, to train over like, months or years of data, you don't want to do that every time to get a new model. You want to be able to take that model, just add today's data, and get a new model. That's what online learning would do for you. Yep. Um, of course, if you only need one model a day, you, you hardly need uh, SRE at all, because if it takes maybe even a couple of hours to create the new model, and it fails for any reason, yeah, you can just fix the problem and retry. Right? It's, you've got lots of time to, uh, to handle this. However, if you want to go a bit uh, fresher than that, if you want to not make a new model every day, but every hour or two, you're, looking at, you, you're going to want to keep it up to date continuously, not just in batch. Like As events arrive, let's update our weights uh, immediate, as soon as possible. Um, and you've still got a fire hose of events arising, gig, arriving, gigabytes a second. More than one machine is going to reasonably process, uh, at least for the amount of computation you have to do on each event. <clears throat> so, so you're going to have to split up the learners. But again, you have the problem that there's only uh, one model to update. But fortunately, each event would update maybe, would have, would have maybe dozens or hundreds of features in it. But your whole model could have billions of features. So if you essentially have a kind of fine-grained locking or have some threads or processes that are responsible for only a small shard of the model, then you can have multiple updates going on simultaneously. And if there's conflicting updates, a bit of fancy math can try and merge them in a sensible way. Because although the, the model parameters might look at one level like a, a big key value store, where you look up from the, the feature, like add contains flowers to the, val to the weight value of 2.3 or something. Um, the, the, the way you can sort of average together the, the updates from different events and batch them up and so forth. And so with a modest amount of sharding, you can um, have all these learners updating the model. The, uh, but this gives you some interesting failure modes. Because all of this model state would be in memory. So periodically, you would, of course, want it to write out a checkpoint to disk. And that checkpoint would uh, you know, then be taken away to serving, to serve the, the, the predictions. But you know, machines fail. Tasks restart. Crashes happen. And uh, and if that happens at any point, well, you've just lost your in-memory state. And now, if you just reload that machine from the checkpoint, it's gone back in time, basically, to the last checkpoint. And so pretty much the entire set of model parameters has to go back to the last checkpoint and start over again. Um, so there's an interesting failure mode there, because if that happens often enough, basically, you, you a machine restarts or whatever before you get to out the next checkpoint, you can make no progress at all, and your models get stale. Um, yep. 
Uh, another way this can fail is you're, of course, training on the, the bleeding edge of these, these features here. As they arrive, you train on them. And uh, that's, that's got a few problems, too, because for one, some of the data could arrive out of order. And for two, uh, what happens if you change your mind about some of those things? Like, uh, not every click is a good click. Sometimes people will try to spam clicks. And if your system for detecting spam clicks shows up a few hours later and says, oh, oh, sorry, all those clicks you trained on for the last couple of hours, most of those were spam. Sorry. What are you going to do? Um, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you just have to go back in time if there's enough of them. Uh, uh, anyone want to know more about the reliability or the failure modes or the service levels of trying to train an online machine learning model? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, question? So, oddly enough, okay, so the question was whether <coughs> SOEs are always involved with machine learning stuff like this, or is it machine learning experts? Um, so the answer is there's, you can have a bit of a division there. You, like, some people will be machine learning math people who are twiddling with features, and actually to them, they know the algorithm underneath, but to them, all of the supporting infrastructure is a bit of a black box. They know how to create good features and tweak the training algorithms to get better accuracy. Then, of course, you've got the people who implemented the code for those algorithms in the first place, and that sort of infrastructure and make these. But as SRE, you, you, of course, would be co-owning this code. You, you might not have to understand the, the algorithm or even you know, what the features are, what they're doing. But you, you would be in a position of pointing out ways where this large-scale design maybe has flaws, maybe needs some extra resilience or redundancy, and uh, as, as well as ways to monitor it effectively. Yeah. And, and that's sort of where your expertise would come in. Because, yeah, the, not everyone who writes machine learning algorithms is going to think like, hmm, how do I make sure that the outputs stay fresh and that it doesn't fall behind you know, every other day? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, essentially the, the last slide now with the. <clears throat> Once you, so the output of that was a checkpoint. Yes, question. Okay. Ah. Yes. So this is an important question, right? There are, there are literally billions, tens of billions of possible feature combinations, especially once you start chaining together combinations of three, three or four different features. And um, yeah, it can get too big for one machine. And part of it is, yes, you can shard the model parameters. But if you decide too soon that, hey, this, this combination of features is kind of pointless, I'm just not going to keep track of it. Uh, you, that, that could be a mistake. Like with enough data, you could discover that, oh, this is actually an important signal. Okay? So, one way to do it is kind of probabilistically sort of start including features when, when they occur often enough. Another way is actually just try to keep track of as much as possible during training and then whittle it down before serving it. So, there's, there's different approaches that you can try. The, um, this, this kind of describes the latter approach, where you, would, you got this enormous checkpoint from your training pipeline, and yeah, you don't want to be serving that it's, if it's going to span like 10 machines or something, right? The, so <clears throat> you basically go through it and say, for each feature or combination, does, does it say anything about the probability of a click, right? Um, <clears throat> And actually, in most cases, it won't. It'll have very little to say. 
and then you basically just drop it because the contribution is negligible. Uh, and then out of that you get a much smaller model. <clears throat> but because your model was huge, and maybe you're processing a lot of different models, if this is a shared service, uh, you can do it as a map produce, and then you might have to take those shards of the model and combine them into a, either a single model over here, or if your model is still too big to fit comfortably on a machine, you can still split it up into shards. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this, of course, of course, it all depends on the type of uh, algorithm you're using. Like some, some types would produce quite a small model. If it's, you can fit half, half a dozen of them in a machine. Others would, could produce a really big model. Uh, um, and then you send it to prediction. Uh, I thought I'd blow up the prediction bit a bit, because uh, especially for the interesting case of enormous models, where actually in serving, you can end up not just replicating the model to take more traffic, but splitting it up in ways so that you can, um, not just for the size of the machine, but for the, the reload strategy. Um, <clears throat> because even if your model can fit on one machine, doing a rolling reload means that that machine is out of action while you are unloading the old model and loading up the, the definition of the new model. Because you're going to get a checkpoint every n hours and, uh, and want to update the model in serving, keep it fresh. Yeah? <clears throat> but if you, if you have it in shards, you can keep some spare memory sort of at the top of the server and not double your memory consumption, really like 10% more memory, and then load up the shard of the new version of the model in the background and immediately flip over to it and your servers can keep running all the time without the, without the rolling reloads. So that's, that's one trick you can do with, with sharding the model. <clears throat> but of course, if it's small enough, you don't need to shard. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, if these shards are effectively key value lookups, you imagine that the thing that comes in from, uh, from the user request is like, hey, there are these features about the page, features about the user, features about the ad. Uh, and what you would get from each shard is get back some weights that correspond to those features. <clears throat> and so you'd need another step to combine those weights into a sensible probability estimate before you can finally use them to decide to show which ad based on the probability. Right. Uh, stuff can go wrong there as well, failure modes, right? Uh, because actually, it, that means that in serving, you're also doing feature extraction. And so uh, you, you could have a case where maybe you've extracted a feature that was never in the model in the first place and uh, have to ignore it. Or perhaps look up the wrong feature if there's some kind of skew. And that is about, uh, that is about it for the, the talk. Has anyone any questions about scaling up or uh, monitoring these things or the failure modes. Yes. What's the precision rate of the model? Do you have any rough numbers of the size of the model? No, I'm afraid I, even if I had the numbers, I, you can't share those sort of numbers. Oh. So, yeah. Um, but of course, you always want to do better. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is going to depend on your trade-off here. Where is the this thing here? The learners and model parameters. So this is actually a tunable thing. It's going to uh, de depend on. It's going to be balanced. You want to update them as often as possible, basically. But depending on your system, the, the constraints are going to make it difficult. Because whenever you do a checkpoint, you're going to want a consistent snapshot of the model. And it's going to take time to route it to disk. So you could, you could say, like, oh, I want to do very frequent checkpoints, keep my model very fresh. But if you do them often enough, you have no time to actually learn from the data, because you're spending all your time writing the, model, the checkpoint out to disk. 
but if you do them uh, less frequently, you can train over your, your data very easily, but you have a longer delay between checkpoints. Uh, yes. Well, it, it would kind of fall out of the property of your system, whether you can do it every few hours or every hour or whatever. Yeah. And, and of course, actually, uh, you're going to end up wasting resources while, while your model is sitting there writing out checkpoints. That's also a concern. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Hope that was informative. If you want to know more, the, well, not no more. If you want to do more large system design, there, there's the session tomorrow uh, where you get an exercise on it. Okay. Cheers.